In the name I am that I am, son of tomorrow, I call forth the light of the living word, beloved Elohim, beloved archangel, beloved mighty Choans of the rays and the lords of karma. I call for the action of beloved Pallas Athena, beloved goddess of liberty, beloved Nada, beloved Kuan Yin, beloved Korsha, beloved great divine director, beloved all seeing eye of God, Cyclopea. Let God's will be done, let God's will be done, let God's will be done. I demand the action of the sacred fire in this hour. Descend thou, descend on mighty cosmos, secret rain. I am the holding of the balance of Lord Gautama Buddha, beloved Sana Kumara and the seven holy Kumara. I call upon the sacred fire, I call upon the light of God that never fails. Beloved mighty, I am present, come forth in this hour of the victory. Come forth in this hour of the victory of the God's flame. I demand the full power of beloved mighty, it's the need of us this night. Beloved Jesus, and to see me, Lord, my dear, God, come up and come up tomorrow. Come forth now in the victory of the God's flame. Good morning and welcome to Navigating the Astrological Matrix. I am your host, your navigator. Welcome aboard. It's Robert Phoenix. Yes, that's me. And uh, we are on the back end of the Venus transit. Wherever you are, congratulations. You've just experienced uh, one of the great astronomical and astrological events of the, well, of the 21st century. And we've got more coming. We have a a major eclipse happening in November. And of course, astrologically, we've got the Uranus-Pluto square, which is coming up and potentially quite explosive uh, in people's lives, both individually and collectively as well. So how was the Venus transit for everybody? What did you get out of it? How did it move you? Is your heart more open? Do you feel more in touch with the goddess, the divine feminine? I mean, this is the energy, and this is the um, the archetype that people have been praising in the prelude and the run-up to the Venus transit across the sun. The one thing else, so we're going to talk about this uh, at length today. Because it's 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 still kind of happening, you know. What we know about these events is that there is the prelude, there is the event itself, and then there is the aftermath. And I certainly experienced that with the solar eclipse that we that we just had, and so we're going to experience this with the Venus transit as well in the days and the weeks and the months. It's not like we have this event and then all of a sudden we get enlightened theoretically and we get to go on with our lives um, and everything has just changed and shifted overnight. Now these things are, they have an impact on us and then they have an impact on us in the aftermath of the event. It's the, it's the waves. It's the cosmic waves that ripple outwards from the events that still impact us and, and will impact us. One of the cool things about the Venus transit is that it was a global event and that it brought everybody together. Now, let's go back to 2004 when we had the last Venus transit. How tuned in were you to that Venus transit in 2004? To be honest about that. Maybe you were. Maybe you were tuned in. Uh, Maybe you were not tuned in. Maybe it was just another day or maybe you heard something about it. But I'll guarantee you this, you knew about this one. You knew this one was coming. You knew it You knew it weeks in advance, months in advance. And what did you do? You participated in it. And this is the difference between that Venus transit and this Venus transit, is that there is a, a, an energy that was global. It was planetary. And 
a lot of it has to do with the fact that where we are with the internet as a conduit for sharing information is so far ahead of where it was in 2004. In 2004, the whole concept of a blog hadn't even been broached yet. Think about that. Blogs, uh, Blogger was just coming online really in around the summer of 2004. So the Venus Transit, now the Blogger was around, but it hadn't really kind of, you know, began to reach into the collective consciousness. And so what we had is during the first Venus Transit was this whole universe of blogging just beginning to come into our existence. And here we are eight years later with the second pass of Venus going over the the north node of the sun. Blogging eight years later is ubiquitous. And how many blogs were covering the Venus transit? I would go onto Facebook and eight out of 10 posts on Facebook were all about the Venus transit. And how, you know, it's the return of the goddess, it's this, it's that. And, you know, you know there's this really interesting uh, series of orbits that the Earth and Venus do together over a period of time. And those orbits form a pentagram. How many people knew that before the last Venus transit? How many people know that now? So what we saw was this really interesting, not just the Venus transit itself, but how we share information amongst one another. Sort of the nascent beginnings of the, of the blogosphere and the full-blown blooming of the blogosphere to cover the Venus transit and make everybody aware of it. To me, this was a really interesting aspect. And what what is, you know, where is Venus? It's in Gemini. And what does Gemini do? It shares information. What, what do bloggers do? Bloggers are writers. We write. And Gemini is the sign of the writer. It's the sign of communication. And the Venus transit starts, you know, at the bottom of the sun and whips around and eight years later comes back up to the sun. And here we have the manifestation of the information age sharing this global event. To me, that's a big story. And it connects the global mind. Now, we may not always agree with the global mind. You know, when I see the return of the goddess, it's like, okay, I'm up for that. I'd love to have a return of a goddess in my life. You know, it'd be great. On a, a very selfish individual level. But what does it mean collectively? And what I what I did on Facebook to a certain extent and on my in my newsletter and I really should have written about it um, on the blog. I just, I just didn't have time. I, you know, I did that post on JFK and uh, and Gemini and you know the Venus transit in its own right. And that and I, I've got a ton of readings from that post. And so I've been really busy, you know, assisting people with readings. And I just haven't had a lot of time to get back to the site and update it. And I'd love to. I've got plenty of ideas in my brain. Trust me. I just have not had the time. So, but what does it mean? What is what you know? What does the goddess mean? In return to the feminine mean. If you look at, and I did this in my newsletter, which you can subscribe to, by the way, at my website, robertphoenix.com, um, and on and on Facebook, I looked at ISIS and the emergence or the reemergence of ISIS as a as an archetype and as in some ways a magical and occult archetype that is used to trigger collective memory in our in our genes and our DNA perhaps past lives if you were there and many of us were there in Egypt and in Rome 
Babylon. And what the ISIS imagery does is it reminds us of the hierarchy of the ruling class, the ruling elites, the pharaohs, and the viziers, and also um, the kings and queens, and the gods, the gods that walk amongst us. What, what opened during this past weekend in the run-up to the Venus transit? In the waxing of the Venus transit, we were gifted, theoretically, with Prometheus, which I've also written about, and, and, and Snow White, which is interesting, right? And who is the main player in both Prometheus and Snow White? It's Charlize Theron, who I've talked about before on the show. And what was Charlie's what image did you see of Charlie's Theron over the course of the last 72 uh 96 hours? You saw two images. You saw her probably as a galactic warrior which would have been uh Artemis maybe a little Athena, Artemis Athena combination. But you also saw her as a queen, the evil queen in Snow White. But you don't necessarily understand by seeing the picture of Charlize Theron everywhere that she's evil, that she's the dark queen. You don't really see that, but you see her as a queen. And what happened over the weekend and up until yesterday? What happened was the queen's diamond jubilee. So we have this image of Charlie Theron as the Snow Queen overlaid with Queen Elizabeth. We have Charlie Theron as Athena Artemis overlaid with the Diamond Jubilee and this whole return of the goddess sort of imagery and flow. We also have Madonna kick off her world tour MDNA in Tel Aviv. This is essentially the, the same tour that she um, premiered at the Super Bowl where she was the quote-unquote living manifestation of ISIS. That's what she was. You go back and you look at that video, she's ISIS. She's ISIS incarnate. And what have we been seeing in the media over the course of the last month? The Time Magazine cover, which I talked about again last week, which was are you mom enough, right? ISIS with, you know, the the the, uh, the young suckling at her teat. And then, of course, the two army women. Again, more ISIS. So we've been, fr- all of this imagery, all this imagery has been front-loaded to the Venus transit. Now, you have to ask yourself, why is that? Why did Snow White open on the... Diamond Jubilee. Why did Prometheus open on the eve of the Diamond Jubilee? Why did Madonna start her tour, MDNA, on the eve of the Diamond Jubilee? Why? So when we see these images and we talk about the return of the goddess, we need to be careful. Because what we're doing in some ways is we're empowering the negative imagery of the goddess. We're empowering the goddess as the controlling she-bitch mother, okay, who will cut your balls off, pardon my expression, but that, you know, that's Callie. And Cal, you know, do we want Callie as our mom? I don't think so. I don't think so. She comes cloaked as Isis, and really what she is is Callie. That's what, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So <clears throat> we have to be cautious that we just don't, You know, open our eyes and our arms and our hearts and go, oh, the goddess, bring it all in. Got to be selective. You know, I I always feel like I'm the guy that's pissing in the punch at the party. I'm the guy that's pissing in the punch at the New Age party. And I'm all for the goddess. Trust me, I am. But what I'm for is something that's not necessarily given to us in the way that it's being given to us. I'm not about that at all. You know, the goddess, and I was thinking about this yesterday. Part of my 
part of my thing with the uh, with the eclipse. I'm sorry, the Venus transit was I went and I did a sauna, and um, it was great. And uh, I thought about well, how how would I honor the goddess in my life? Well, I'll tell you how I do it. I would get, and I, and I just didn't have time. I had to do a reading last night, so I couldn't really do it. But I would get every single image of every single woman that uh, I am friends with on Facebook that has touched my life, right? Or people that are part of my website or this show that have touched my life. And I would I would take a little image and I put it into a giant collage. I put all these images together because I would honor the goddess as these everyday people, i.e. women, that I consider to be a manifestation of the divine feminine. And I think the divine feminine, and this is for me, and I know, I know that there are people that are like, well, it's it's inclusive. And women can be a warrior. Or women can be, uh, you know, a breadwinner. Or women can be this or that. For, for me, the divine feminine really gets into uh, these 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 characteristics that really separate us and make men men and women women. And, I'm, and I don't want to sound like an old fogey being sexist, but, you know, I, I feel like the return of the divine feminine is the return of – the feminine that was pre-feminist uh, indoctrination. You know, maybe and maybe what we do is we go through these things and we synthesize them, and we're on the other side, and we we've integrated them. You know, whether it's whether it's feminism or whatever the ism is, there needs to be an end point to the ism. Because if it's not if it's not if there's no end point of the ism, it becomes a prison. That's what happens. There needs to be a point of integration. It's like, okay, I got that. Now I'm ready to reintegrate some of these things that I thought were weak or passive or which made me vulnerable. And for me, the return of the goddess is the reintegration of some of those aspects into the life of women. And for men, it's about being able to realize that those aspects are important to us and that we have to step up and be men to be able to to handle that and to bring that into our lives. And so then what we're talking about is the divine masculine and the divine feminine, both coming together. And that's where I think it's at. And to say that this is the, the return of this, it's almost exclusionary. And this is what happens. We get into this new age sloganeering and we don't really – drive into it and go into it and get into it because it just feels good. It feels like I just want, I want to get on that ride. You know, I want to get on that ride. I want to, I want to pay my $2 and 50 cents. I want to get on that ride. And I just want to ride it because it feels because Everything else feels shitty and we need something to feel good about. So I'm just going to get on that ride and I'm going to go, yeah, this is how I feel. Yeah. This is going to build my self-esteem. Yeah. I'm, I'm with us. Let's, let's do something together. And I'm, I'm for that, but it's like, understand it. Grok it. Take it apart a little bit. And then get into it. That's just me. It's just me. That's how I operate. That's how I roll. Because I don't want anybody just telling me what to do. Or I don't want anybody just telling me how I should accept something or embrace something. Now, if it's if it's really in my best interest, I'll do it. Absolutely. But I'm not going to just, you know... You know, eat the eat the eat the communion, eat the collective communion. So the return of the goddess for me is really the return of some really deep and fundamental values that honor life, the sanctity of life, and that cuts across being male or female. And we say, you know what, this is important. We have to say no to this. We have to say no to this thing, whatever that thing is. Maybe that thing's drones flying over the United States. Or maybe that thing is depleted uranium in weapons. Or maybe that thing is materialism and buying things just for the sake of buying things. Maybe that's what we're talking about. Say no to that. And returning to more organic values, sustainable values. And I'm not talking... You know, the, the green the green meme. And I'm not talking about that at all. 
I'm talking about natural, organic values. I'm going to get into a story later about what happens with inorganic values, and it's going to blow your mind. It is going to blow your freaking mind. And I'll do that maybe in the second hour of the show so you can stick around. It's called the tease. You can, you can uh, hang out with that for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to get into a reading here quickly, somebody on the 206 line. And I'm going to uh, – don't, don't go away. Hang in there. I'll read for you. But I'm going to share a Venus transit story that happened to me yesterday. It's an interesting story. And this was um, – this is kind of my highlight of the Venus transit in some ways. So I was playing baseball with my kid, and we went to this uh, baseball field in Berkeley. It's not a field that we go to but it was close to where we were. And so I brought up my, you know, the, the bat bag and balls and, and all the stuff that we, we used to play with. And we went to this very nice field, by the way, really well manicured, best grass I've seen on any field in the East Bay. And the infield was pristine. It was so pristine. I didn't even want to go on the infield. So I stayed on the grass and I was working with my son on pitching. And, uh, you know, here I am, father, son, and that part of Berkeley um, is primarily black. And the black and the families that have li- lived there have lived there for a long time. So it is uh, historically uh, a a black neighborhood. And we went, and so we're playing on this field, and then eventually these three kids came out on the field, and they're playing ball. Now I'm going to share with you that they were that they were black kids. African American kids, if that feels better. Um, and normally, I, I would just say they're just kids, but there's a reason why I'm sharing their ethnicity with you, because there's this is this is it plays a it plays a an important role in the story. So here I am, I'm with my kid, and I'm and I'm and I'm working with my kid, and I'm thinking about well, where are their dads? Do they have dads? Did they ever have an experience like this? And how do they feel about this? Are they envious? Are they angry? Do they even feel anything at all? You know, as I'm working with my kid, I'm thinking about these other kids. I'm trying to understand what their relationship is with their fathers. It's kind of a Venus transit thing, right? And I'm watching them play. All they have is a tennis ball. And they're throwing this tennis ball around, and they're running around. And they're kind of like imitating us in some ways. And then I would watch them kind of beat each other up. I'm not talking about like little horse, but kind of really rough, like beating each other up. And then they go back to playing again. So I kept watching them. And um, for the majority of the time, it was my son was pitching and I was catching. And I was the person that was closest to our bat bag, which was still about maybe 30 feet away from us. But then we switched, and my son was the one that was catching, and I was pitching, and he was the one that was closest to the bat bag. And after we did this for just a few minutes, two of the boys broke off from their plane, and they started to slowly walk towards our bat bag. And I I was watching them, and I said to myself, what's going on here? You know, I was aware of their, their movement. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because immediately I intuited and interpreted that they were going for that bag. Now, then I said to myself, well, they're black, and I just can't go walking over to that bag and take that bag, because in my mind, I was beginning to profile them, right? All these stereotypes were banging around in my brain, and I didn't like them. I didn't like the stereotypes, and I needed to find a way out of that polarized thinking, and I did not want anything happening to that bag. I didn't want that. I didn't want them rummaging around the bag. I didn't want them taking the bag and running with it, which I did have a vision of, by the way, 
whether it's my fear or not, I don't know. So I'm thinking, how do I find a win-win situation where I can get that bag and not just fall into this kind of automatic, robotic, stereotypical reaction, which would be to go over there and get the bag and say, F you, I'm just getting this bag. So I thought about it. It was like, oh, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to ask my son if he wants to hit. And so I said to him, hey, Griff, do you want to hit? I'm going to hit a few balls. And he said, yeah, sure. And I said it loud enough for those other kids to hear me. And then I walked over to get the bag. And as soon as I began to walk to get the bag, those kids turned and walked in the other direction. They went back. And so what I did is I, I scuttled their plan, whatever their plan was. And I gave them, theoretically, an out. I didn't just react. And I think that the story has merit for me. Maybe it has merit for you. But to me, that was the Venus retrograde twist. It's how do we take care of ourselves and how do we take care of our positions without being reactive? How can we find in that moment a win for us that is not exclusionary or selfish? Look, I don't, and the other thing too is we don't know how a reaction like that or a response like that, which could be a conscious response, can change somebody's life. We don't know. We just don't know. Maybe by doing that, and I, I'm not well, I'm not saying that that was any great, you know, act of a saint or anything. I just wanted my kid's bag with all the balls. And I, and I also didn't want those other kids to feel like here's a stereotypical reaction to who they are and their environment. I didn't want that for them either. And we don't know how these things can impact other people's lives. Just don't know. You're not around. You're not around to see something that can change somebody else's energy. So the reason I'm sharing this for you is that, is that nothing is in vain, you know, especially if it's done with an act of being conscious and aware of what's going on. And then I told my kid, I use that moment as a kind of a teaching moment. And I said, do you see what just happened? And for my son, it was about awareness. I said, this is what just happened. And what you need to be able to do in your environment is to be aware. So always be aware. So that was my Venus transit moment. And we'll see where that goes. Oh, I don't know. I know where it went. I got more Venus transit moments. Maybe I'll talk about them on the uh, in the second Second hour of the show. Let's let's get into some readings. Let's see who this is and what they want to talk about. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Oh, I didn't think I was going to be first. Well, there you are. <laughs> Hi, it's Holly. I'm just checking in. I'll just make it quick so other people can call. I feel bad for calling again. So what's what's happening, Holly? How how did the Venus transit affect you and and um, your mom and your and your ex. Well, I've just been taking your advice and um, being quiet for two weeks. Uh-huh. I haven't really, I haven't really spoke my mind. Good. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So I need to wait one more week and do that. Yeah. yeah. How's it going with with uh, not not saying anything? It's hard for me. I have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> So, so every day I think I got to remember what Phoenix said. Don't say anything. Two weeks, you know, one more week to go. Don't. Think. Don't okay, do so it. Okay, it's been hard. It's been hard for you to not emote and express. How have the events around you been? Um, calm. Okay, that's what it's you want. Here. You want. You want some calm, right? Yeah. Yeah, you want to be able to deal with it from a place of kind of conscious response. Yeah. Yeah. But um like do you see this working out with me and him? Oh. 
<laughs> no, no. No? You're a Scorpio. I know. You know, once you make a decision, you make a decision. You know, I mean, that's, I mean, Scorpios, once they make up their minds, they've already gone through all these different scenarios. Um, I don't know. Because you've been calm, because you haven't said anything, they're calm. That is, has it seemed more appealing now? I mean, is that what's happening? Has he backed I off? This? Maybe that's it. I don't know. You know, I don't have the answer for you with that. I mean, I think that there are things that you are requiring. Here, here here's what I'll say. Okay, uh-huh. I'll say this. Give yourself another week okay. or two weeks, whatever that, whatever I said was, and yeah. and then and then revisit this. Don't uh, don't have any judgment on your situation, and revisit okay. this. Okay. Because my sense yeah. is is that you'll have what you want to do really theoretically is you want Venus to go direct. And once Venus goes direct, you'll have a better understanding of really where you are with the relationship. Okay. When does it do that again? Let me get out my uh, trusty ephemeris. I'll give you the exact date here. Let's see. So Venus goes direct. Um, the end of the month. Twenty-eight. It goes direct on the twenty-eighth. The twenty-eighth. And then a lot of people say, "Well, you've got to wait until it goes goes back to where it went retrograde, which was, I believe, twenty-four degrees, which would put it right at the beginning of August." But I don't think you have to wait. You don't have to wait that long. But I would definitely, um, you know, I would definitely hang out and not be reactive until then. And if my mom mom gets out of the picture, could it work out for us or just a still a no? Uh, you know, Saturn goes direct too, just before then at twenty at uh, twenty fifth. Look, I would. Here's what I would say. I, I would say withhold any judgment about it working or not working. Okay. okay I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna make I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the space to make your own choice around this. Okay. All right. And I think that what you have, I think by by not being in a reactive mode, because when people are in reactive modes, like. Like if I say to somebody, hey, you're an asshole, and even if they are an asshole, what are they going to do? They're going to say, well, fuck right. you. You're an asshole too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. if you're not react, if you're not in a reactive mode, if you're in a responsive mode, which is kind of what the moral of the story was with the kids in the park, then yeah. you, can, you can affect a different outcome. But I think within a week and certainly within two weeks, when we're getting much closer to uh, Venus going direct and really Saturn going direct as well on the 25th, then where then then you are you can begin to see and you you can begin to make decisions and choices from a responsive and not a reactive place. So, you know, hang in there and, and be kind of without judgment. And and just and if it's calm, stay with the calm. You need calm. You can make better yeah. you can make better decisions when you're calm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, the at the end of the day, um, you're going to have Saturn hit your sun. You know, it, the Saturn sun cycle for you starts in in October, and then you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna be more focused on your 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 personality. And your your essence, really your kind of core essence, starting in in October, and a lot of these peripheral um, experiences around relationship and the dynamics around relationship, those things are going to be kind of moved to the side a little bit, and focusing on who you are and what your uh, what your solar essence is and what you're supposed to be doing, that really moves to the forefront from October okay. and beyond. 
So between now and then, allow this relationship stuff to settle and, and, and be objective and to be calm. And, and again, I would, I would wait a little bit before you begin to speak your mind and make moves. Okay. I just don't want to be single again. I'm just tired, tired of well, it. Well, I hear you. I, I hear you. I get that. But, you know, what you don't want to also do is settle, right? Yeah. And that's hard sometimes. Yeah. But with Saturn, with Saturn on your sun coming up on your sun, um, you know, Scorpio is really deep and transformational, and Saturn on your sun is really going to be about getting very clear. And there's no gray area with Saturn on your sun; it is black and white. Uh-huh. You know, so you know whether or not you make moves now. Trust me, by the time Saturn gets to, to your sun. You will say, okay, I'm either in this and I'm in it for the for the duration, or I'm out of it for the duration. Yeah, yeah, there is and, no black. I mean, it is black and white with me. Yeah, and Saturn will Saturn will catalyze that that very distinct separation of realities. So between now and then, though, be calm, hold your peace, and wait wait for these planets to go direct. And then you can okay. begin to, you know, make different kinds of more conscious decisions and have a different different style of communication with people in your life. Okay. Thank you again. You're welcome. Do you want to go back on hold? <laughs> no. No, I'm going to – I have the computer today. I'm going to listen on the computer. All right, Holly. Thanks for calling in. Take good care, okay? okay? Bye. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Our friend Holly, soundless in Seattle. Let's go to the 786 line. Hey, oh, you're in here with Robert. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you today? I'm good. I do have a question similar to uh, Holly. Okay. Um, man is a relationship question. I was wondering how my astrology and everything had to do with what, what I'm going through, what relationships and dating right now, meeting people, and one mm-hmm. person would have been in for me. Okay. The right time. All right. Um, because there's nobody on hold, I'm going to do a, a, a full solar chart for you. Oh, that's exciting. Yes. <laughs> uh, what's your name? Normally, I just read. Normally, I just read. I'm sorry. I'll do a natal chart for you. Normally, I do solar charts. I just look at the ephemeris. Um, oh, cool. and, but uh, I'm going to do a natal chart for you. Thank you. So, um, yeah. There's nobody on the line. What's your name? Gigi. Gigi. Mm-hmm. I have a friend named Gigi. Awesome. <laughs> What's well, my nickname? No one calls me about everybody calls me Gigi, so I'll just Are you Giselle? No, it's Geralda. Geralda, interesting. Yeah. See, that's why I go with Gigi. <laughs> yeah. All right. And when's your birthday, Gigi? July twenty second, nineteen eighty five. Okay, and what time? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I have you on. I was putting you on speaker. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. What what time were you born? Ooh, I think it's 7, I don't know if it's 7 p.m. or a.m. I think. I know I should know this, right? I think it's 7 p.m. I don't know if it makes a big difference. It's 12 hours. It, it makes a significant difference. <laughs> okay. Oh, and, and where were you born? In Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to go with the. Call my mom and ask her (laughs) what time I was born. I'm going to go with the 7 p.m. Okay. All right. So July 22nd, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 85. All right. What's interesting about that is normally. At that time of uh, of the at that point in the zodiac, it's usually at like 29 degrees Cancer, and you manage to somehow sneak into zero degrees Leo, which um, is pretty. It's pretty big. The difference between 29 degrees Cancer and zero degrees Leo is like two different worlds. So you're really Leo in terms of your expression. 
Um, <laughs> you've also got um, Mars, uh, Mercury, and Leo. It's, it's at 24 degrees, um, so it's actually it's kind of uh, uh, at the other end of Leo. And you have Mars in Cancer at 28 degrees, which makes it conjunct your Sun. So it's an interesting combination of Mars in this um, kind of you know receptive and moody um, yet nurturing water sign, and 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 sort of this you know. Uh, Really, you know, kind of solar masculine, uh, and it, and what we know about the the zero degrees in in any sign is that they're the most potently expressed at zero degrees. So you're like more Leo than any other Leo, right? You're like really Leo, and uh, and so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna exhibit those qualities, but you're also because of the conjunction with Mars, you're gonna get this really interesting fusion of being empathic uh, and uh, and uh in in nurturing and and so it's it's a, it's an interesting combination it's very male the sun mars conjunction but because mars is in in cancer and it's a feminine sign it gives it this sort of uh uh kind of underlay of of intuition and nurturing and wanting to uh love and grow things so they're not necessarily that dissimilar to be honest with you, but when I look at your chart again, if it's based at, if it's the 7 p.m. time, um, both of those planets are in the seventh house, so relationships are really, really important to you uh, in the seventh house. Uh, you know, you in some ways you kind of need relationships in order for you to fully experience who you are as um, as a solar entity. You know, so relationships open you up. Relationships will trigger. Um, you know, sort of the keys to your identity. And the thing for relationships with you, because you've got that sun and you've got that, that Mars and Cancer, is you need, okay, you don't need, but it would be, no, let me just ask you, I'm, 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 I never want to take this for granted, right? Um, uh-huh. are, you, are you into men? Do you like men? Oh, yes, yes, I do. Okay, let's get that out of the way. Um, <laughs> so the type of man that would be really appropriate for you is somebody who is really a man like you know exhibits the qualities because your your leo so son <laughs> your leo son would reflect that you know you would want a really you know masculine figure um to reflect this kind of inherent uh expression of leo which is powerful by the way so you'd want that and and it would be more sort of traditional masculine archetypes but at the same time with that mars and cancer just below that leo son like a pure macho guy would completely turn you off. So you've That's you've true. got you've got to have this also sensitive quality and somebody that can intuit your moods. And somebody that can, I'm drawn to them. It's crazy. I think they're masculine and tough. They won't let me walk all over them, but yet they're emotional and sensitive. You can be a, you know, what's interesting about that is, is that you know, you've got Saturn in Scorpio in your chart. And so Scorpio men would ground you and would allow you to 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 tap into that um to tap into that Saturn and that Saturn trines Mars. So, you know, anytime you would get like a somebody that was born um, you know, in the anywhere between like uh eight uh, man, where's your Mars? It's at twenty eight degrees. So it'd be like um nineteen to twenty nine degrees Scorpio. They would try Mars in your chart, and that would be What's really. What's twenty nine degrees Scorpio? Like what day? Would they uh, that, that would be probably from like I don't know, maybe like the. Oh, let's see, like the. Like the tenth of November to like the twenty second of November. Okay. If you were to go in the early degrees of Scorpio, like anywhere between zero to zero to ten, which would be at the end of October to around the eighth or ninth of November, then you, what you what you've got in your hands is you've got a sun sun square, and that's not really that good because yeah. because your sun is in Leo and it's at the at the most fixed degree of Leo there can be, and Scorpio is a fixed sign as well. And also, you know, you've got Jupiter um, in Aquarius. So if you're with somebody, you know, like that would be like between five and 
you know, 50, uh, 5 and 15 degrees Scorpio, and then they're, now they're squaring your Jupiter as well. So you really don't want that. Okay. So if you're going to get into a Scorpio situation, make sure it's the latter the latter yeah, part. I, so what would be like the, I know there's an alternate best, like besides Scorpio, what's right, what would be a good sign for me that I, I would Scor- I think Scorpio, if it's at the end degrees of Scorpio, would be really good. Okay, because I met you, right? I met a Scorpio who was born on November 3rd. For some reason, there's something I don't really, eh, I'm not feeling in at all. The other, the other, another good match for you would be Leo, another Leo. Okay. I'll I mean, if, yeah, I mean, if you had somebody that was a Leo son, that would be you know, between, you know, 5 and 10 degrees, that'd be terrific. Or even somebody at the end of Leo where their son would conjunct your Mercury, that would be great as well because now they're showing up in your seventh house. And that's really, I mean, if you want to talk about like, you know, kind of an archetypal king queen relationship, that would be two Leo sons together in the seventh house, you okay. know, some, somebody that can really meet you. And if they're a Leo, they're probably going to have, you know, maybe Venus and cancer. So that would be a good thing for your Mars and cancer. Um, or they may have Venus and Virgo which would not be terrible, by the way, for you, because you have moon. um, Well, your moon is in Libra, but your eighth house is Virgo. So they'd have Venus in your eighth house, which would be a transformational relationship for sure. Um, Yeah, so I would go either late degree Scorpio, um, any any degree of Leo, to be honest with you. So do you think this is a good year for me to find find that? What's that? I think this year would be a good year for me to find that, or this summer finding someone. Uh, let's see. Well, it could be an interesting time for you because you've got Chiron and Venus in Gemini, and that's in the fifth house. Uh, so that's the house of you know of romance. Certainly, if you want to kickstart a romance or or open your heart, uh, it would mm-hmm. be a good time for you because you're going through the Venus transit right now. I mean, Venus is sitting right. Venus is sitting right on your Venus. Yeah, because is that why I've been meeting people and kind of going out on dates and meeting people like online? Is that kind of yeah. why that is that coinciding with? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And because but, your Venus Venus opposes Uranus in, in your okay. chart, you've got Uranus and Sagittarius. And sometimes with the Venus Uranus opposition, relationships have a really hard time rooting. You okay. know, like you can. What do you think will be a good good time to like? I know. I'm open to it right now. I'm very open to it. And that's well, that that's a good time. I mean, the Venus transit, it's not going to be, you're not going to get Venus going across your natal Venus again. One of the things that's also going to happen is Venus is crossing your your Chiron uh, in Gemini. And one of the things with with people who have Venus and Chiron in Gemini, you were born in, I just, I just read for somebody who had that same, that same, um, uh, that same aspect. Interesting. Um, the weird thing about the Venus Chiron conjunction in Gemini is that there is a desire to have a person in their lives that can do a lot of different things. People yes. that Venus and Chiron and Gemini require versatility in their relationships. That's true. And when you and when you meet somebody who's versatile, not everybody's versatile, by the way. Not everybody can, you know, go out and have dinner with somebody that that works for a Fortune 500 company and then go out and take ayahuasca in the jungles. You know, not everybody can do that. Not I like every, that, though. Not, not everybody is going to be able to keep you amused all the time. And because mm-hmm. Venus in Gemini, Chiron in Gemini, gets bored really easily. So, yeah. so you know, you're going to have to make peace with that on some level. Yeah. But, so you said this is a good time to kind of keep looking, and but then is it the, the, the right time for that to come into my life right, right now? Or great time. And I think what what the Venus transit will do is that it will it will it will get you in touch with this really interesting dynamic of you know how to keep a relationship alive and what your responsibility in that is. Gotcha. How long does the Venus in transit last? Well, so I feel like I have to hurry, or I'm, I'm screwed. Well, no. I mean, <laughs> Venus is going retrograde, and it goes direct in 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 uh, at the end of the month. 
And by by the time it, so it's right now. You don't really have to hurry. The thing what you just have to do is be open. And you okay. and going and going out and dating that would actually be really good for you right now. Do so you think this summer is like a, would be a good time? I think summer would be good because Jupiter goes into into Gemini, and where does it go? It goes into your fifth house. It's so, wonderful. so there you, now you've got this. You know the the it's like it's kind of this you know, the the one two punch. Venus goes retrograde. Part of what you have to do though is you have to go through a past life review and relationships, and it's like what what has not worked and what has worked, and, and everybody's doing this by the way. I think <laughs> but I think you, I like for you it's really specific because you've got Venus in Gemini and you've got Chiron in Gemini. She dropped. I don't know why she dropped. Well, it felt like that 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 call was coming to an end anyway. There's a bunch of people on hold. Well, let's go to the next person on hold who's been there for 13 minutes. Let's find out who they are and what they want to talk about. Hey, you're in the air with Robert. Thanks for holding. And who are you and how was your Venus transit? Hi, Robert. Um, I'm now um, calling in from the Netherlands. And the Venus transit was um, really intense and interesting. I've been doing that um, with you, the relationship with you. And um, I've had a few surprises along the way. I had my birthday uh, on the 31st of May. And um, I celebrated the weekend in a really inspiring way. It was beautiful. I met um, really warm people. It was heart opening. And I'm kind of wondering, like, where um, I'm headed next, you know, with all this stuff, this whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for calling in all the way from uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I, you know, I have a really good friend who was born on the 31st of May and um, her world just got thrown into utter chaos with relationships uh, as the Venus transit hit and everything for having to do from moving and finding a new place to live to um, her brother having a, a relapse with um, uh, his, his uh, drug dependencies uh, and, and her business just going into full tilt with these auditors and going after her books. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is, is because she has relationships in her life that are out of balance and they're out of balance inside of herself. Right. And, and this is where um, the Venus transit really hit her. And if the V and if you have been in balance with the, with your, with your own relationship with yourself during the Venus transit, because it's very, very important. Your, your Gemini sun and this Venus transit went right across literally right across your sun over the weekend. Very, you know, very powerful. Um, you, you, you can have an opportunity to expand and create more novelty in relationships. Why don't you go ahead and give me your birth date and I'll, I'll just go into the ephemeris and find out what I can see based on that. When were you born? Um, uh, 31st of May, 1982. Okay, 31st of May, 82. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Um, but Robert, I, I know a bit of astrology and I, I know that it was going through my eighth house. Uh huh. Um yeah. And I I've got a question about like um Venusian things for you. Actually it's kind of like I've got Jupiter and um Pluto conjunct my ascendant, um and then it's opposing my Venus and I've got Venus in Taurus in the seventh house and Chiron on the cusp of the seventh and the eighth house, um, also in Taurus. So, like, I've been in one relationship to the next, and um, I'm just kind of figuring everything out and, and wondering, like, um, what is it I need to learn, and, and like, um, how do I um, really create something authentic and, and something real? Um, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, you know, based on, well, it's, it's really, it's, you've got this really intense opposition with, with uh, uh, Venus and Jupiter in your chart. It's really, you know, because they're, they're fixed signs. You know, you've got that Jupiter uh, in Scorpio uh, and you've got that Venus in, in um, Taurus and they're both at really early degrees and you've got to figure out, you know, how to honor, um, you know, that, that polarity 
and, and that duality. And I, and I think ultimately for you, the Saturn, the Saturn Jupiter conjunction, which happens in October is going to offer a lot of, a lot of insight and clarity with this. And I, I love Saturn Jupiter. I think Saturn, Jupiter, Saturn Jupiter conjunctions really bring everything into very clear focus and real balance and you have you have the opportunity with the Saturn Jupiter conjunction to both expand and build simultaneously. And because uh, your Jupiter is in Scorpio and Saturn, you know, and also being in Scorpio, the the opportunity to build and grow have very long lasting effects. And I and I think that this is a point in time, you know, in terms of predictive astrology, that is. Um, monumental for you and and really kind of destined for you i think the key for you in relationships is um you've got to live with somebody i i think for you to take that step and to take the leap of actually living with someone and building a home and building a family is really important because that's where venus gets its greatest uh sense of potential and growth you know, Venus in, in Taurus is really solid, and, and it's all about the beginning stages of Taurus. So you need that. It's really important, I think, for how I see it. And, and taking that step and making that, taking that leap forward um, and, and, and planting a long-term relationship, I believe the window for that is in October when you move into that Saturn – Jupiter conjunction. You've also got Jupiter moving onto your sun this summer as well. And it, yeah. will be on your, it, it will be on your sun almost for the entirety of 2012 once it moves into Jupiter. I'm sorry, once it moves into Gemini. So th- uh, that's really auspicious. And we were, um, you know, looking at all these alignments with the Venus alignment, with, um, the the annular eclipse where and the moon by the way was right on your sun during that annular eclipse right the 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 new moon was on your sun and this is the genesis of new beginnings new emotional beginnings and 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 so i you know is right on your mercury as well i think really to be honest with you you're in the perfect place you know when i look at your chart your chiron is in is in taurus now it's not conjunct um, your Venus and Taurus, but you can learn a lot mm-hmm. from that Chiron. You can learn from that Chiron. That the challenge with Chiron and Taurus is incarnation. That's incarnation. That's, yes, incarnation. Yeah. About being in the body, being on this planet. You know, realizing that hey, I am a soul that has decided to be here. You know, during a very intense and pivotal and hairy and chaotic. In transformational time did I really want to be here I don't I don't know I don't know but I'm here now and that's the challenge with Chiron in Taurus is it's being in the body and Jupiter has just moved across your Chiron and whenever Jupiter moves across Chiron you know I I'd liken that experience to, to being like you know spiritual um, spackle you know Jupiter you know spackles the cracks of Chiron and patches you up and gives you kind of a sense of feeling okay and more grounded until ultimately you go through your Chiron return, which is the next, I think, a a very pivotal time for everybody on this planet, and that's a ways off for you. So so Jupiter going across Chiron is like, it's like a, a, hey, you're okay kind of moment. You're going to be fine kind of moment. And more than that, it's like not only you're okay or fine, but you get to really experience um, a kind of a resurgence of self-esteem. Chiron is the shadow. Chiron is the unclaimed part of who we are. And people that have Chiron and Taurus have they have body issues sometimes. They don't always, you know. Sometimes they can have really tremendous bodies. Like you know, maybe as a woman, um, you would have a really voluptuous body and be kind of this, um, you know, archetype for men and be ogled by men and not be okay with it, you know? Say, you know, that's too much attention. I want to wear sweaters or I want to, I want to, you know, bring my, you know, 
body, you know, more into a private space. There's something about Chiron and Taurus where at an early age, people have uh, body issues or, or incarnational issues. And really, you're here to fully experience the body and to, and to, and to embrace the body and to say, I'm here now. I love my body. I love what my body can do. I can heal my body issues, whatever they are. And for you, it's related to relationship. The two are intrinsically related, Venus in Taurus and Chiron in Taurus. And in relationship, theoretically, if you can have somebody that lives with you on a day-to-day basis, what happens? They get used to your body. You get used to them getting used to your body. And now you're, 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 you know, you're, your bodies are co-mingling and cohabitating, and you're building something together. I think that's the key for you. And really, the, the, the Jupiter transit over Chiron, which just happened, and all this Venus stuff and all the annular eclipse, and, you know, all of this has been, you know, triggering this, you know, desire to partner and find the other, you know, in Gemini. And really, yes. I believe the culmination of this is the Saturn on your Jupiter right at the beginning of the, of the Saturn transit from Libra to Scorpio. That's a really powerful moment for you. Thank you so much, Robert. I, I just um, want to ask you something very quickly before I hope. Well, thank you for everything. It's it's like really, really good to hear um, what you what you think about like my chart. But um, I kind of met this guy a few years ago, and he's been popping in my mind during the Venus retrograde. And I think I'm gonna see him next month. Um, and talking about Venus Chiron, his uh, Chiron conjunct um, his south node actually. Uh, conjunct to my Venus and our synastry chart, or do you, do you think you could like um, have a quick read of like um, his his uh, chart and stuff? Well, I think it's an interesting. I, that's a really interesting uh, combination of aspects, and I, and I and I and I think it would be worthwhile uh, to explore uh, reconnecting with him, and with your Chiron uh, conjuncting his South Node. Um, there's, there's, there is definitely a uh, rekindling of, you know, what some people would call a past life relationship for sure. It's certainly a past mm-hmm. life relationship in this lifetime, right? Um, and theoretically, it could be a rekindling of a past life relationship in another lifetime. And the thing, too, about the Chiron uh, South Node conjunction is that... Um, sorry, Robert, no, it's um, his uh, Chiron... Uh, south node in Taurus conjuncts my Venus, and um, then my Jupiter conjuncts his Venus in Scorpio. Like oh, yeah. His Chiron. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, go into that with an open mind and an open heart. And I think the key to that would be. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, what his history is like um, post relationship with you, but I think the key to that meeting would be to somehow come to some sort of internal agreement, not with him per se, but some sort of internal agreement that it would be okay to be vulnerable. You have to be able to be both people have to be able to willing to sit with their vulnerability and allow their vulnerability to be transformed and come into a kind of a, a greater sense of, 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 of love and um, resonance and profound healing. I, I believe that there is a really uh, fantastic opportunity for healing to occur with this. And, 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 and if you decide you want to build on this and create something out of this, um, I wouldn't rule it out of the question. But I think I think being okay with vulnerability uh, in this meeting is key to this meeting, and to be gentle and to be uh, uh, soft and to and to take things slow and to allow it to just kind of organically uh, evolve uh, while being together. Allow moments. Allow moments to to extend with this person. Don't necessarily force things and make them you know happen. Uh, you know, immediately, but just be ready to allow this something to emerge. And I, and I, and I really believe that something really sweet 
and profound can emerge through this. Oh, thank you so much, Robert. That's, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, well, great. Enjoy, enjoy the, you know, you're right in the mix with this Venus transit. So just enjoy it, be with it, um, and, and allow it to spark and stimulate you know, all these really interesting connections inside of you and, and, and dance with it. Thank you so much. Okay. Take good care and thank you for calling. Thank you, Robert. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All the way from the Netherlands. Wow. That's profound. Okay. Let's go to the 540 line. Hey, you're hey, on hello. the Hey, hey. How's it going? I'm um, great. How are you? I'm um, I'm good. I'm good. What's your name? This is Eric. I've called in a couple times before. Oh, hey, Eric. Hey. Um. Uh. I was just curious what you might be able to pick up or what you might be able to figure out um, about whether it might be a good idea or not for me to travel to Vegas at the end of this month. <laughs> are you a gambler? Not, not for gambling, though. Actually, I'm not really intending to go to do much gambling. Uh huh. But uh, I'm tending to go there to learn more about futures trading. <laughs> Which is, I can... It's a form of gambling. Um, okay, when's your yeah. birthday? September 15th, 75. Okay, uh, September 15th, 75. Well, hopefully we'll have the uh, the economy will still be happening by the time you go to Vegas if you go. Uh, let's see. September 15th, 75. And you're going at the end of this month? Yes. Okay. Do you have? A, I'm just, and I haven't looked at your dates, but are, are there other options for other times to go? Well, there's there's this week long seminar that I'm planning to attend, so that's uh, they might do it another time, but this is the only time I know of right now. Okay. All right. So you've got Mars in Gemini, and um, so the accumulation of information, uh, data exchange, Mars in Gemini, um, and that's at uh, 17 degrees. And uh, what, what, do you? So I'm just looking off of the uh, the uh, solar chart. Are you a, a Capricorn moon or Aquarius moon? You know, I don't really know. I think uh, you're an Aquarius moon. I think that's because I, you know, I'm just not looking at the exact moon time. Moon changes. Uh, let's see. So let's just go with your Mars because I think your Mars is a key indicator here, and it's at 17 degrees. Let's go into the ephemeris. We're looking at whatever is happening at the end of the month at 17 degrees. Let's find that out and see where we are with that. Uh, end of the month, 17 degrees. So we're talking end of June and so Venus. Yeah, Venus is at. What day does it start on? Does it start on, on a Monday? Is that, is that the week you're going? Yeah, on the 25th. 25th, okay. So let's see. Well, the good news is is that uh, Saturn goes direct that week. So that's that's not a bad thing for Saturn to go direct. Uh Venus does not go direct just yet. It goes direct on that Thursday. How long are you going to be there for? About a week. Uh huh. So you go from Monday to Monday. Is that it? Well, I, I'll probably be getting there about Sunday and leaving Friday or Saturday. Okay. Um, I would say I would say if you're going to go, stay until Saturday. Because what you want to do is you want you want to, you want to get the benefit of Venus going direct at that time and it goes direct on Thursday and um, it, it's it's actually uh, it's a wide conjunction with your Mars it's a it's really wide your Mars is at 17 degrees so it's 10 it's a 10 degree orb so I would say the timing is good and hang out there for as long as you can okay and and even even if you could even if you could stay until Monday or even Tuesday, that might be even better, believe it or not. Yeah, I really wish I could. The problem is my mother's birthday is on that Sunday, and I'm planning to uh-huh. go with her. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, you know, you know, I would say it's, I would say it's cool. I would say it's fine. Uh, the other thing that's going to be happening uh, while you're there is um, the moon. The day that you get there, uh, the moon will be conjuncting your sun in in uh, Virgo between Monday and Tuesday. So you're going to have a moon sun conjunction, which is good. I mean, it's a mundane kind of conjunction, but it allows you uh, to settle in and feel at home very quickly in your surroundings. Okay. So that that's good. We like that. And, and, and the other question. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just wondering. Um, do you? Uh, I'm just uh, also just generally trying to uh, consider changes professionally. Like what I do right now is I'm a software engineer. Yeah. But, but I'm trying to sort of shift gears and maybe see if this other trading possibility might work better for me. You know, I think it's a really worthwhile exploration because Venus is going over your Mars, right? I mean, Venus. The Venus transit right now is going right over your Mars, so you're thinking about, you know, Mars is how we how we manifest our will in the world, and um, and so you're you're reexamining that relationship. And look, if you are involved in software and you're involved in systems, which is what software is, you know, this whole futures trading thing is another system, and I think you could master it quite easily, and you might even be able to build your own software for or improve software that is based on futures trading i think you could be quite successful because really what you're doing is you're just trying to understand so now keep in mind that the futures market as you're going to find out and i and i've seen this the futures market is dominated by computers now right and before you you know there's a really interesting documentary and you may want to find it it's called the pit and it's about um it's about these guys that were these hardcore, weathered, you know, um, le- leathery figures that would get down into the pit and do the futures trading. And all those guys, are, they're dinosaurs now. They've all been displaced by computers. Mm-hmm. So, so you've got an advantage. If you've got a software background, you've got to get really smart, though. And you're going to have to get up to speed quickly. You've got to have, you're going to have to understand who you're up against in terms of being able to trade very, very quickly and being able to understand these patterns and these cyclic forces. And by the way, if you can somehow uh, uh, incorporate astrology, you'd be, a, you'd be a leg up on these people. Hmm. So, you know, if you can figure out, you know, how to, because Mars and Gemini is very versatile and it's being able to take, um, you know, hard data and getting into that kind of, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwellian kind of blank world and using data so fast that it's almost like intuition, but it's also using diverse sources of data. So you may want, I, I think it's really worth exploring. Now, how long the, the futures market is going to be operating? You know, cause good question. it's a good question. And, you know, the big boys could just say, Hey, you know, fuck you. We're shutting this thing down. You know, too many people are making too much money. Um, I think the banking system would likely collapse about the same time that the futures market. Would I agree. Collapse. I totally agree. And the futures market is really, the futures market is 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 the is the uh, it's the brass balls, you know, market right now. And I, you know, if you're smart, and with that Mars and Gemini and Sun and Virgo, you are smart. Um, and if you're willing to take some risks, I think you can be successful with this. Great. Uh, one other quick thing is you did a reading uh, natal chart for me on 420, and you mentioned something about a Jupiter, something to do with Jupiter, I think, this month. I don't uh, know if there's, a, I don't know yeah, if there's anything. That was, that was in conjunction with Mars, and that's when okay. Jupiter, moves, Jupiter is moving into Gemini, and it, and, and, and it moves into Gemini in June. And, and you're going to feel uh, the Jupiter uh, influence on your Mars. Just when it moves, it'll it's still it'll still be early degrees. But my you know my theory about when planets change signs, even if they're 15, 16, 7 degrees out, you're going to feel that change. There's just a fundamental ripple effect in the change of a sign. So Jupiter beginning to conjunct your Mars is going to give you a lot more confidence. So if you're switching tracks, uh, career tracks. Jupiter is going to is going to say, hey, you can do this, 
you're smart. You know, one of the things that you look for is kind of Jupiter Mars indicators, especially in your, if you're in that environment with Vegas and you're learning this thing. It's like you're gonna go. You're, you're, they're gonna be. They're gonna be like epiphany moments. Hey, I can do this. I can do this. I get this. Right. That's where you can so begin to go out on that ledge. And as Jupiter gets closer and closer and closer to your natal Mars, which will go in 2013, um, you're, you're going to know that you're headed in the right direction. So that's what I was referring to, I think. Okay. Um, well, I, I appreciate everything, Robert. Okay. Hey, you're welcome, Eric. Enjoy Vegas. And um, just go along for the ride, man. You know, I mean, what the fuck? I mean, this is all fake anyway, right? Well, on, some, yeah. on some level, this is all fake. So you may as well roll the dice get into the fakiness and the synthetic proportion of it, and you may as well go big. So that's my advice to you. Okay, great. I appreciate everything. All right, man. See you later. Thank you. So there we go. It's all a hologram anyway, people. What do you want to do with it? Let's go to the 2112 line. Hey, thank you for holding. Who are you and where are you calling from? Is it New York? Oh, yes. Hi. This is Rick. Hey, Rick. Welcome to the show. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, how's everything? <laughs> everything is pretty good, man. I got my own issues, but you know, I've got I've got more positive things happening in my life than not. That's always a good way to focus. Yeah. So what, what's uh, what's on your mind today? Well, a um, couple of things. One, uh, I'm thinking of going to China in the next week to visit my kids that are visiting there. Okay. Also, also, I'm transiting to trying to well, not trying. Shifting from one um, a job to another. Okay. Kind of uh, so big, big, big. Tra- you got travel questions, and then you've got uh, a big life question. So you're you're you know, in the micro, you've got decision making. The macro, you've got a, a transition. Uh, when's your birthday, Rick? Twelve three sixty one. Okay. What do we got here? Let's see. Um, Taurus rising. Taurus rising. Uh, do you know the degree of your Taurus? Seven. Seven. So uh, Jupiter is still in your first house then. That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, 12, 361. All right. Um, the other end. Hold on. All right. 12, 361. Okay, I'm there now. All right. Uh, so you're the opposite of our last caller, Eric. You've got Mars and Sag. Right. And so you're dealing with the opposition of, of the Venus transit on your Mars. Mm-hmm. And um, th- that that's a little trickier, right? Because there, there's more of a sense of, of duality and polarity and am I making the right move? Am I doing the right thing? You know, right. he, he's kind of in alignment. You're more at odds with, um, and especially because you've got your son also uh, in, in uh, Sagittarius, and um, you're, again, you're dealing with the Venus transit in, in, in opposition with that. So I would say that it is it is a lot less clear cut. Um, and, and how do you? Let me ask you a question. How do you feel about making the transition? I feel like it's about time. Like. I've been wanting to do it for so long. It's just the money that's holding me into this other job that I don't want to be doing, but it's money. Yeah. And uh, there's so many things that I want to do uh, other than that with, to make money. And I know I can. It's just the comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the comfort zone is, you know, to be able to make a decision where you're following your passion mm-hmm. in a time where – uh, you know, banks aren't lending money, or if they do lend money, they're for you know stupid startups, or you know, I mean, it's 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 a challenging time to follow your passion. But I'll share this with you: your Mars is in Sagittarius, right? Uh, and, and it's conjunct your Sun, so you're you're for the most part, and, I don't, and I'm not saying this uh, in a demeaning way. You right. are ide- you are ideologically driven. Sure. And, and you cannot do something that is not in alignment with what we would call your higher purpose. Right. And Sagittarians are here to experience their higher purpose. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, when we go through, you know, uh, the galactic alignments, 
at the end of the year, really, that's your time. Right. And, you know, and this is the prelude to that galactic alignment. You know, people don't really understand, you know, that everything that we're experiencing with the Venus transit right now, the back end of it is at the end of the year. And, mm-hmm. and, and it, you know, this is the front end. The back end is the galactic alignment. So, you know, that's your time, you know, and everything that you're going through now with the, all the oppositions with um, the sun and Venus, the good news is, is that you've experienced the full moon, right? The full moon or the moon it's, has, has gone through its various stages on its way to fullness. It's touched your sun. It's touched your Mercury. And it's, ch- it's touched your Mars. Right. So, so the question is, how inspired are you? How enthusiastic are you? Are you ready to take the energy of that full moon and to really just plunge straight ahead into a new career path? Because that's, that's, right. that's the kind of commitment that you're going to need in order to do this. For you, you have to dispel doubt. Gotcha. There, there can be no doubt. And if you're willing to dispel doubt and you're willing to forge ahead with all that great Sagittarian energy, right. the payoff for you is at the back end of this year where you're like, you know what? I made a good move. And not only did I make a good move in changing this career path, it's really more just a career path. This is a soul path. This is really where I need to be. Now, between now and then, you may be tested, by the way. Mm-hmm. But 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 if you can take the fullness of everything that's going on in the opposition and, and be in that midpoint, you know, what is the midpoint between Venus and Sagittarius? The midpoint between Venus and Sagittarius is Leo, by the way. Venus right. and Jefferson. Uh, no, hold on. Let me, no, hold on. The midpoint is it's Libra. It's Libra, and it's finding it is finding that 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 sweet spot between uh, 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 Gemini and Sag. It's Libra. You're right in that center. You're right in that center spot. You know. So that's where you that's where you need to be. Well, and I have my moon in Libra and my twins are in Libra. <laughs> what's that? My moon is in Libra, and my, I have twins that are in Libras. There you go. That's a, yeah. So let's get back to that that the, the travel. Um, I think it's a fine time to travel, um, and, and um, there's an interesting correlation between uh, Gemini and Libra, and mm-hmm. because they both represent some form of duality. Mm-hmm. With Libra, with Gemini, it is it is really what I would call an undifferentiated duality. It's duality that is like the zygote before it splits. We know it's going to split, but it's kind of undifferentiated. We know duality is inherent but it hasn't gone to the other yet in Libra. It has split and we are dealing with the other. So, so, you know, it, it's a, a real interesting dance. And when Venus went retrograde, it was trying, it was trying uh, Saturn and Libra. Mm-hmm. And so when are you leaving by the way? Well, if I leave, it'll be like next week, next week. And how long are you going to be there for? I was planning three, three weeks, about three weeks. Beautiful, because by that time, Saturn will have gone direct uh, in, in Libra. Um, and what, what degree is your moon? Uh, I think it's 11. 11, okay. So uh, uh, Venus will go direct, and it will be it will find your moon. So you have a Venus moon trying. That's lovely. I think it's a great time to go. All right. Yeah. yeah. So if you're, gonna, if, you're, if you're getting, like, Rick, if you're going to make the transition – and shift careers, just do it and don't look back. Yeah. And, and, and just know that, that, you know, by the end of the year, you're going to get all the pertinent feedback that you need to realize that you made a good choice. You know, you've gone through your Chiron return already, right? Chiron mm-hmm. has already touched your Chiron, and that's really fundamental. And what happens is, is that when people go through their Chiron return, it's like, it's like, it's like I'm done with the bullshit kind of a moment, uh-huh. you know, and, and it's like, you know, I experienced it on my car on turn. It's like we're going to live now for things that matter. And my Chiron is in what? Do you know? I don't even know. Your Chiron is in Pisces. Oh, okay. And, and, and Neptune is conjunct your Chiron, by the way. Oh, so, yeah. By, by the way, my moon is 20 degrees. I just looked it up. Oh, 20 degrees. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're going to get the benefit of 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 uh, the uh, the Saturn the Saturn moon trying okay and and uh, if you're there for three weeks uh, Venus will will it will go direct and it will trying your moon okay I'm sorry conjunct your moon 
Prime Dark Jr. So wow. again, still a great time. But that Neptune in Pisces, I don't know what you're doing or what kind of career shift you're making, mm-hmm. but but it's got to it's got to evoke a quality of soul for you. This sure. Has, this has to be soul work for you with that Neptune on your Chiron. Definitely that. Now, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's definitely the way I need to to be connected is when I'm idealistic, meaning inspired. You know, I'm inspired. Absolutely inspired. Yeah, otherwise I get low. This like it doesn't work for me. Yeah. Well go do it, man. Go do it. Right. And, Sounds and be, great. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. Be, yeah. And let us know. You know, call back at some point in the future and share with us how that's going. Yeah, I'm basically going for filmmaking and uh photography and Awesome. Uh, Neptune and uh, Ky- Ky- Neptune Neptune is, is the sign a uh, Pisces is the sign of filmmakers mm-hmm. and directors. Perfect. Perfect, oh. perfect, perfect. You're on it, man. Beautiful. Thanks, man. Nice talking to you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Awesome. He also has Jupiter and Aquarius. And and Jupiter does incorporate, or Aquarius does incorporate filmmaking, especially now that we're doing CGI and a lot of this is happening with computers. And we know that Aquarius is all about computers and software. We're going from the emulsion-based medium of film, which is Pisces, and emulsion is things like petroleum products, which then begin to be rendered into celluloid, which captures frames. That's Pisces. That's why we talk about film as being a Piscean medium, but we're moving into the digital world. That's Aquarius. And he's got two different Aquarius. Had I known that, I would have shared that with him. Let's go to uh, 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 tr- Trite Static. Here we go. Tritostatic, trite static. Yes. Hey, thanks for calling in. Hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> thanks. Uh, I, this is the first time I've called in. Sorry. Is it, is it trite static? Oh, is that sure. What it is? My name's Candia. Yeah. Oh, hi. Trite hey, static. But... What is trite static? Can you can you enlighten Just, us or inform us? With, what, why is that? Why is that your uh, your Skype handle? Uh, it was kind of. I made it a few years ago when I was a little bit more depressed. So it was a <laughs> knock at my own writing that it's trite and static and it's never. I get know. it. You've got a sense of humor. This this is kind of. This is kind of an act of, of, of healing and kind of, of, of making light of it, right? Yes. I like that. And what's your name? Is it Candace? Yes, Candia. Candia. Well, hi. Thank you for calling in and welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, I was wondering if you could look at my chart and see if there's anything changing with my career and if I should go back to school or if I should try to stay where I'm at. And when's your birthday, Candia? This is June 29th. Ooh, you just dropped down on us. What year? Ah, Skype. Candia, um, we can't hear you. You might be able to hear us. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going. If if you can hear me, I'm going to disconnect you, and call back in. And let's see. Yeah, she's dropped. Call back in, and we re, we'll reset that line. Okay. We'll reset it. Just call back in, and I'm going to reset uh, my my end. So call back in, and we'll get you in here, okay? Let's just reset everything. Let's reset the table. Okay. Let's go to the 7881 line. It's not the 781 line, 781 caller. Hey, you're on the air with Robert. Hello. Hello, Robert. Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure. What's your name? My name is Jesse. Jesse. So, you know, normally, Jesse, it's mostly women that call into the show, yeah. And uh, I'm totally psyched that I've had three men today oh, call really? in. Nice. So this is great, man. This is like the Gemini thing coming into play. Balance. We're getting right some on, balance here. Yeah. So what's on your mind today, Jesse? Uh, you know, I just uh, I've, I've been following your work for a few months now, and I really enjoy it. Your uh, your weekly installments, and um, you know, I just, I've just been in a funk a little bit myself, and just kind of. Uh, you know, looking for a little, a little uh, filler information. I, I'm, I'm pretty interested in astrology as it is, but certainly not, you know, to the next level. Okay. Anyway. Well, what's, what's your birthday? It's September 25th, 1981. Okay. Uh, let me just dial in there and get there. And it's easy to be in a funk, man. We live in funky times. 
No, I know, I know, I know. And I'm actually feeling pretty good, but, you know, still. All right. So there we are. Uh, uh, let's see. So you're uh, two degrees. Let's see, September 25th, one degree Libra. You're right at the beginning of Libra. Uh, looks like you've got a Virgo moon, early degree Virgo moon. And uh, Mercury, Libra, uh, Venus, Scorpio, Mars, Leo. Great place for Mars. Uh, Jupiter, yeah, yeah. Jupiter and Libra. Super conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn in Libra. Uh, yeah, and I'm uh, 30, so this is uh, like my Saturn return, right? Yeah, you've come through your Saturn return. Um, and congratulations on that. Uh, yeah, that's really tough, right? It can be. You know, it really it depends on where people are in their lives. Um, you know, sometimes for people, uh, Saturn, if they haven't really taken care of business, uh, Saturn will kick their ass. And if they're kind of on their game a little bit, and Saturn will, will help them build. And for you, Saturn, and, you know, looking at your chart, you know, you had Venus. Uh, see, it's not Venus. You had uh, – well, your, your Mercury is kind of far off your Saturn, right? You know, right now, Saturn's on your Mercury, and th yeah. and that's the funk, man. You know, that is the funk. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I I really have been, uh, you know, kind of in place. You know, not not really uh, moving as as quickly as I'd like to be. Yeah, so that's that's where that's where your funk is, and so you know, when Saturn is in, in you know. Uh, uh, Saturn, when Saturn was conjunct my Mercury, because I have Mercury uh, in Libra as well, uh, one of the things that I did is, um, and it's probably not your thing at all, uh, but I got sober. You know, it wasn't like I was, a, you know, a heavy drinker or anything, um, yeah. but I just decided that I needed, I didn't want that distraction in my life. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want to go socialize in a bar, and so I stopped drinking and for me, that was this moment of clarity, a moment of sobriety with Saturn on my Mercury. And wow. and it allowed me to get really lucid and clear and and be, be able to make, um, you know, better choices and decisions and focus on my website and my clients and, you know, not disperse my energies. Um, it, also, it also had a resonance in terms of relationships with me. And um, I needed to get much clearer on boundaries in my relationships. So yeah. I don't know what that picture looks like for you, but there's... Well, it's funny because I actually had a uh, pretty tough time like two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago. My my wife kind of left me for a little while, and we're back yeah. together now. Uh -huh. and she's she's an early Aries, so I think we have a lot of opposition, yeah. but, um, but also a lot of complementary, like it's a good working relationship. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I understand that that Venus in Scorpio can be problematic for me as well. Uh, it, it can be, but, I, you know, the only time Venus in Scorpio can be problematic is if um, the individual feels threatened and it feels like the sanctity and the safety of the relationship uh, or relationships in general are, are in jeopardy. And if you've already gone through a phase where you separated and you're back together yeah. um, with your wife, you've gone through a transformational cycle with Venus and Scorpio. You've gone through the death of the relationship. You've gone yeah. through the fear of losing the relationship. So oh, now, yeah, big time. Yeah, now Venus and Scorpio becomes your ally. Excellent. And Venus and Scorpio allows you to hold space and to be a transformational uh, witness within relationship. Uh -huh. So now you've gone through the darkness. You've gone through the dark night of the soul with the relationship, and you're much stronger, you know. That's, and that's I don't know what's going on with your wife currently, but if she's back in a relationship with you, she's she's realized this, you know. Yeah. I, I got to tell yeah. you, I got to tell you, most women when they leave, they don't come back. I know, I know. That's what I figured, and I, uh, you know. And honestly, I, I almost, like, just kind of let it go, and I was at a point where I could have gone either way, you know what yeah. I mean? And I was happy to have her come back. Yeah. But, so. Well, here you go. You mean, you've, you, congratulations. You've achieved something that most men do not achieve, by the way. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, and because because a lot of men, by the way, will they will act out, you know, and they'll say, "Fuck you, fuck that bitch," yeah. right? Yeah. And oh, there was there was some of that, definitely. <laughs> I'm sure, but you but you kept enough of that door open, and you've held that. Yeah, well, you've held that well, stay. the thing was originally she she had told me that she wanted to stay friends, and I was really like against that idea at first. Yeah. And then I kind of softened up to it as it, as we went along. You know, as women say, yeah, I still want you to be in my life, but I don't know if we're going to be like close friends. You know, right. as they say. But um, but yeah, it worked out. Well, but there you. is still some unbalance in the relationship because she is working really hard right now yeah. at her job, and I am, let's say, self-unemployed. Yeah. I, I think it's frustrating for her to be carrying a lot of that weight. Yeah, and, you know, uh, that is hard, you know, and, and, and your relationship won't, I'll be honest with you, it won't last if that continues to go on. Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. Because, because of the opposition, right? Because because yeah. of the, the Venus Aries stuff, and, yeah. and and you know, that's it's a look, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I've got so much experience in this world because yeah. my ex ha, has Sun and Aries and Venus and Aries and conjunct, exactly conjunct, and I've got three planets in Libra. Yeah. So, well, and my wife has a Venus in Taurus. And oh yeah. Yeah, and I think where's her Mars? Uh, moon in Aquarius. Um, Mars is in. She has a Mercury in Pisces. I think the Mars is in Aquarius too. Uh huh. But yeah, and I think most of my my stuff is is between Cancer and Sag. Uh huh. And she, and she kind of has all of her planets on the other side of the chart. Right, so she's figuring out who she is as um, is she more on the individual side, like with the Aries stuff and the Taurus stuff. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, she she's a very um, with uh, she's she's not your typical like in your face Aries, you know. Uh-huh. I mean? She's she's kind of um, self-contained. She really avoids conflict, you know. What's her rising would... sign? Do you know her rising sign? I think her rising sign is in Leo, I want to say. Interesting. Yeah. Well, if her rising sign is in Virgo, or if she has a Leo rising with a mostly Virgo first house, which could be the case, yeah. uh, uh, people uh, with um, – that if that was the case, then she would be much more conservative and circumspect than other Aries. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like to mix in a little Chinese astrology – uh huh. Two and and she's got the 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 rabbit year, which I the think rabbit is very year. diplomatic. I don't know if you if you dabble in that sort of I thing. I do either. dabble. I do dabble. And, in and she she's time. younger than me too. She's six years younger than me, so there's a little gap in that. So way. she has not gone through her Saturn return yet either. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And she so and she's uh so she's got about what about four years away, five years away from her Saturn return. Yeah. 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 So she's still she's still forming, you know. She's she sounds like well, number one, she's young, and number two, she's she's also kind of um, kind of a young soul in some ways. With you know, yeah, with, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm I'm far more into uh, religion and spirituality than she is, and um, and she's very like materially uh, minded, and that's yeah. okay. I don't I don't really mind that at all. But you know, we're we're kind of on different pages sometimes. Do you want to do you want to go back to school? Me, not really. I I kind of regret spending so much money on school actually, uh-huh. or or taking on so much debt. Yeah, as it was. Yeah. And I I uh, I was a liberal arts student and hasn't really like paid off, you know, in that sort of sense. I think I think the education I got was was fantastic. Yeah, but, you know. With all with all this Libra in your chart and with Venus and Scorpio. It, it, you know, it would be a shame that uh, for you to not be able to to counsel and work with people in some way. Yeah. And and I and I would try, I, as, as you know, looking at your chart, I and 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 seeing that you would you you need some form of purpose uh, in your life and some form of income. I would try to find a way to do that. Yeah. Well, I've I've actually been, um, you know, I was for a while I was on the legal path. Uh-huh. I worked in a couple of law firms and uh 
and I I was engaged in 2008, married late in 2008, and um, I also kind of had some like, you know, I guess you you call it quarter life crises. Yeah. I realized that like 9/11 was was not what we were told it was, and these other things, and and I just you know my my worldview started to fall apart. Yeah. And so I I ended up quitting a really nice job at a law firm where I you know wasn't really like satisfied at all though, and I, I found I didn't really care for the way law is practiced. Yeah. And uh, so I I, I kind of quit on a whim. I mean, not really a whim. It had been building for a while, but it, it was definitely a surprise to my to my newly betrothed. Yeah. And uh, that that set us off down a, a tangent. But a few months later, I kind of decided I wanted to be self-employed, and I I had been um, curious about the the whole silver story, yeah. as it were. And yeah. um and I got into to precious metals, and I've I've been promoting and selling silver and accumulating silver and I have a website but it's been kind of stagnant for about eight months now yeah and I, I, I want to really reinvigorate that that effort yeah but, um, you know not really sure about how to how to take it on uh, I know I need advertising I know I need a, a lot of different things but, yeah uh, yeah so which, by the way I think silver is a great metal to be in yeah, well, you you just kind of addressed that in your in your latest entry on JFK there. Yeah. But um, you know. But yeah, uh, it, it's it's kind of in a it's it's very counterintuitive right now. It's it's very depressed price wise, but the the story has never been better. Yeah. Have you did you ever follow Henry Makeout in his site at all? I did, but I I, I kind of threw him out the window a little yeah. bit recently after, over the Jeff Renz thing. Did you did you ever follow the articles with him in uh, Aloysius Fosdyke? I did. Yeah, yeah. I, that was that was my favorite part about his blog, and uh, I, I found it like very entertaining, even if it is maybe like a fictional character or something. Did, but did you did you see what uh, what Fosdyke said about silver? Um, a while ago. I don't. I haven't been following him lately because, like I said, I kind of. I, I got turned off on on Macau, but he, um, Fosdyke said that gold would be the metal that would be that would be threatened, and that nothing, yeah. and and when, when he said that nothing would ever happen to silver, because yeah. he said that it's the devil's metal, it is the devil's currency. Okay, I, I remember, and I, I actually com- commented on that, and I I said, well, isn't isn't lead the devil's uh, metal if if the devil is kind of related to Saturn and silver right. is related to the moon. Yeah. But I guess the devil has some lunar qualities too. I don't well, know. he talks about. I, I think what he was talking about, right, was the uh, uh, was thirty it, pieces what, of silver. Jesus. It was Judas. It was the forty pieces of silver with Jesus. Yeah. 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 That, and that and that was that's what he was referring to. Yeah. Well, it, but it, it's it's not so much the silver that's that's evil, but the the act, the betrayal, right? Exactly, exactly. And I just thought it was interesting. It was like, oh, okay. Well, put your money in silver. <laughs> you know, if they if, yeah, if they if they honor silver that much, you may as well get in and insane it. I think it's, look, I think it's good. I think I think it's a, I think you I think you're you're onto something. I would stay with it. Uh, in terms of your website, I mean. You know, look around. Who are the guys that are, are that are that are moving metals? Paul Drock. Yeah. Where's Paul Drock? Yeah. He's on Jeff he's, Brent. He's, right. Yeah. Well, you, exactly. And the thing is, I'm I'm in New England, and I don't really know about um, you know, outside of the Boston area, but I'm in the Boston area, and there's there's only two places to get physical silver in this entire metropolitan area. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's talk offline. And if you want yeah. to do something with me and my website, um, yeah. be happy to do that, and we'll, we'll we can talk about it. Excellent. Thank you very much, Robert. All right. Well, listen. Thank you for calling in, and pleasure having you on the show. And and just uh, stay the course, man. Great. Thanks a lot. All right. We'll see you. Bye. Okay. There we go. Lots of conjunctions happening with the Libra there. Had to do a little little networking. Let's go back to Trite Static. Hey, are you there? Yes. 
Okay, you dropped off, so, so it, we we had we had to make an adjustment. Okay, quickly, um, what's your, your what's your birth date again? Six twenty nine eighty four. Six twenty nine eighty four. Okay. All right. And um, what what are we what are we what are we checking out here? Careers. Yeah. <laughs> if I should make a move or if I should just stay where I am. All right, here we go. Um, here, man, I tell you, the the Gemini thing has been so prominent today. You know, you're right. I mean, you're right. Um, let's see. This whole this whole path with career and what should I do and in relationships. You've got Chiron in Gemini. Do you know, do you know that? Uh, yes, it's me. And you've got you've got True Node in Gemini, right? So yeah. so so, my answer to you is, um, if you have an impulse to change your career, my 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 answer to you would be, follow that impulse. There is one caveat, and that caveat is, is that Saturn is conjunct with Pluto. And that's a little tricky. I would, if I were you, I would wait until Saturn shifts and and goes into Scorpio because you're at the anoretic degree of Pluto and Libra. And that's really challenging. And I would say that before you've got, in fact, you've got two aspects of anoretic degree uh, in your chart. You also have Uranus at 29 degrees. Um, I'm sorry, Neptune at 29 degrees. Sagittarius. So timing for you is a big deal in your life in general. And I would say during this Venus uh, transit and Venus retrograde, if you're, do you have prospects right now to change your career? Do you have things out there? Not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. And I have avenues I could take, but not, nothing that's really... Okay, I would wait. I would play the waiting game a little bit, and I would wait until until Saturn moves across your Pluto. Because between now and October, there's a lot of things that can happen between now and October. You know, especially as Saturn gets closer and closer and closer to your Pluto. So I would wait and I would accrue information. At the same time, I would, you know, I would take advantage of what happened with the uh, the, the new moon and the, and the annular eclipse, which was right on your true node, I would take advantage of that, and I would do a lot of R&D. And if you want to make a shift in your career, gather information. It's an information gathering time. And then I would, yeah, and I would wait until, until, until Saturn moves across that Pluto. And then when it moves into Scorpio, what happens? Now it becomes much more advantageous for you because you've got these, you've got all this Cancerian energy in your chart. You want Saturn to try on your Sun. You want Saturn to try on your Mercury. You want Saturn to try on your Venus. Now Saturn's on your side, right? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. what's happening for you is you're going to go into your Saturn return. And that's yeah. a big moment in time. Wait. Wait until Saturn moves into Scorpio. Then move. Use this time to gather as much information as possible. Gemini's about reconnaissance. Do your reconnaissance work now, okay? I feel that. I understand that. Because I have been feeling more like I need to gather stuff, but I feel it's kind of like I can feel the push, like I need to do something, but I understand that. The the push is valid. The push is real. But the push doesn't mean move down. Right. That makes sense. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. Thank you for calling in. Change, change, change that, uh, change that Skype handle. It's time. <laughs> okay. I'll see you later. Bye. Okay, we've reached pretty much the end of the show. Ten minutes left. It's been a great show, by the way. I love the mix of the male-female dynamic. We had cool men calling today. We had some really evolved men come in, and I love that. I love it when, when you know. We got we have men that 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 uh, that honor you know these uh, these intuitive systems and and are and are using these intuitive systems in order to navigate their lives. This is what I was talking about at the beginning of the show. 
And we almost had about a 50-50 mix today of men, of, of, of men and women. Awesome. Great. Love it. Why do I like it? Because it, it, that's that's kind of how I am. And, um, you know, it's it's what I, with all the Libra in my chart, it's what I aspire to. All right. So here's here's the story I wanted to tell you about, okay? All right. I got to find the right link because I got to read this. I, I got to read this story to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend the next 10 minutes with this story. All right. Hold on. Um, let me just type this in. Hold on a second. It's going to blow your mind. All right, here we go. Hold on a second. I'm almost there. Almost there. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Uh, dot, 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 dot. This has to do with Avril Lavigne. Do we know who Avril Lavigne is, everyone? Does everybody get it? Do we know who Avril Lavigne is? Avril Lavigne has come out through Matt Levine, who is her brother, that Avril Levine is a transsexual. And I just read this piece on, uh, where was it? It was on Lunatic, it was on a Lunatic Outpost. It was on, uh, it was on, I think it might have been on Before It's News. Avril Levine is, is her, Avril Levine's brother has come out and said that she's a transsexual. So Avril Levine was born a boy. And Avril Levine was given uh, female hormones to be a girl. And apparently, according to her brother, Matt Levine, it's out there. You can see it. It's out there. Dude, Google search it. It's out there. Her brother has come out and, and shared the entire story. Avril Levine had her Adam's apple removed, by the way, apparently, according to the brother. And that, and that Avril Levine's career path was all carved out by her parents, that she, he, she was going to be this skater chick. Avril Levine apparently is, was also high school friends with uh, the, this Canadian beauty queen who was, who is also a transsexual. They went to high school together, the two of them, their best friends. And, and this Canadian beauty queen, the one who caused such a stir for being in this beauty pageant in Canada, her boyfriend was the gay male por- the gay male porno actor who chopped up the body parts and split to Europe. They're all connected. I'm going to write about this. They're all connected. And if you go to uh, places like Lunatic Outpost and Godlike like Productions, you'll see there is this very unusual connection between Avril Lavigne and Chris Crocker. Chris Crocker was the internet sensation about leaving Britney Spears alone, just leave her alone. Facially, very interesting uh, connection between the two. But all of this is coming out with the Venus retrograde, right? Hermaphrodite, changing sexes, changing sexes. Who's a male? Who's a female? What are they? And I got to tell you, I got to tell you, if if this is the world to come, it's a fucked up world. I'm sorry. Editorializing, it's a fucked up world. If it leads to, you know, chopping up body parts and, and sending them to people, you know, through the post and running off to Europe to escape the long arm of the law, this is not a world I want to live in. This is not a world I want my kid to live in. You know, the synthetic Luciferian, you know, sexual reassignment is a nightmare, people. It's a nightmare. And this is a manifestation of a nightmare. Pay attention. Pay good and close attention to it. 
It's a nightmarish world, and it's it's not going to get better. We're not going to get used to it. It's only going to get worse. So I just wanted to share that with you. Breaking news, Avril Lavigne, not a girl, not a woman, her brother. Unauthorized biography. Hateful. It's a hateful biography. It's, am- it's, it's amazing how we use the term hateful. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you a I'm going to give you a headline. If somebody has tortured you, if you've been if you've been the a, a, a quote unquote victim of abuse, wouldn't hate be an appropriate response? Wouldn't it be an appropriate response? Would would hating being tortured be something that that would be a natural response? If it wasn't natural, would, would, what would that say about you or the person who would – you know, I, I hate, look, I'm not into hating other people or other races or other cultures. That's a dead end. But hate in some ways – hate is like the extreme version of not liking something. And I'm not saying you're into hate, but if you don't hate the way somebody treats you, then you're not alive. Hate and anger, demonized. Can't be hateful, can't be angry. Just be emotionally neutral. Gender neutral, emotional neutral, emotion neutral, gender neutral, sex neutral, thought neutral. Dumb it down. You know, I was on Facebook yesterday, and I'll share this with you. Uh, And I saw, you know, how people, they put these little messages on these images. Facebook has become the uh, the Stuart Smalley. It's like a caricature of Stuart Smalley. I'm okay, and you're you're okay too. And you know what I mean. You know Stuart Smalley, right? Phil Hartman. These it's these it's these uh, these these platitudes, these saccharine platitudes. This woman put up. You know, if somebody if somebody uh, is critical of you or negative negative if somebody is being negative with you just blow you know just just leave them don't don't you know don't uh you know don't get hooked into their negative thinking or their negative feelings just walk away from them well there's some truth to that but sometimes you know what we've done is we we we've we've eliminated the ability to have discourse that engages critical thinking, you know, and being able to take criticism without feeling like somebody is being angry or hateful towards you. Because sometimes criticism is warranted. Sometimes somebody says something to you, it's like, you know what? You're being a real jerk. Oh, no, you're being hateful. I can't hear that. Or you're being small-minded. Or you're being uh, arrogant. Or you're being... You know, it's, sometimes these things are warranted, and sometimes we have to lay down our, our, you know, our infantile shields that somebody's going to say something that's going to hurt our feelings. It's going to pop our little New Age bubble. You know, sometimes you have to let that in. So you know, you're right. I'm going to let that sink in. You're right. I was being closed-minded, or I was. I was being, you know, I was projecting. I need to let this in so I can change my life. Thank you for sharing that with me. And then there's times where you have to sit back and say, hey, screw you. You're wrong. I've checked it, man. I've checked it inside and out. I've checked it. You know, I've checked it. That's wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to lovingly and respectfully push back on that. Anyway, that's my rant at the end of the show. I want to leave you on a positive note. We achieved balance today. We achieved we achieved a level of synergy. Take it. Use it. Be with it. Grow with it. I love you all. Use your head to discern what's possible. Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart to say open what's possible. I'm Robert Phoenix. I'll see you on Friday. Adios. 
In the name I am that I am, son of tomorrow, I call forth the light of the living word, beloved Elohim, beloved archangel, beloved mighty Choans of the rays and the lords of karma. I call for the action of beloved Pallas Athena, beloved goddess of liberty, beloved Mala, beloved Kuan Yin, beloved Korsha, beloved great divine director, beloved all-seeing eye of God, Cyclopea. Let God's will be done, let God's will be done, let God's will be done. I demand the action of the sacred fire in this hour, descend now, descend on mighty cosmos, secret rain. I am the holding of the balance of Lord Gautama Buddha, beloved Sana Kumara and the seven holy Kumara. I call upon the sacred fire, I call upon the light of God that never fails. Beloved mighty, I am present, come forth in this hour of the victory. Come forth in this hour of the victory of the God's flame. I am the full power, beloved mighty, it's the meaning of this night. Beloved Jesus, send it to me, Lord, my dear, Gautama and Son of Kumara. Come forth now in the victory of the God's flame. I call upon the light of God, 